Okay, so um, <laughs> thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Thanks for the to the organisers. Uh, I was delighted to be invited to come and uh, talk uh, at the school that was being organised this summer. Um, it's a uh, it's a shame uh, that I can't be with you in person. Uh, I'm here. Um, it's not actually daylight or even countryside outside my window, but um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to be with you uh, virtually at this early hour in the morning in England. Um, although it's uh, disappointing not to be in India um, this August, um, instead we have this opportunity to, to join and uh, has been, as has been said, in some ways there's an op opportunities uh, to, uh, to meet and interact more easily uh, from a distance. So I'm going to give a talk this morning on uh, to start the meeting on cosmological perturbation theory. Um, this is a, a topic that uh, has fascinated me since I was a PhD student some years ago now, and uh, really since I've uh, since those days we've um, found. If I can move on to my next slide. Um, uh, really a surprising model, uh, what has become uh, the standard model of cosmology. So as I'm the first speaker, I, I think I need to show uh, the, the big picture uh, from this uh, uh, lovely uh, graphic uh, produced by the WMAP team um, of what has uh, become the standard cosmological model uh, of the evolution of our universe over the last 14 billion years uh, from initial conditions in the very early universe, uh, we have a, a very consistent picture of the um, development of structure, um, the stars and galaxies that we see, see around us in the universe, um, albeit uh, including a variety of uh, different components in the universe, not least the dark energy at the present time. So this is a, a, a remarkable picture of the universe we now have and um, it's been said that uh, remarkable claims uh, such as this uh, require remarkable evidence. And really the evidence, uh, the confidence we have in this model um, of the universe comes through the cosmological perturbations, through the inhomogeneities in the matter and the radiation uh, in, in, that we see around us in the universe. Um, not least of those is uh, the cosmic microwave background that distant radiation uh, from the edge of the universe. Um, and indeed, uh, when I was a PhD, just starting as a PhD student, uh, NASA, NASA launched the COBE satellite. And uh, in 1994, we got our first uh, direct evidence of structure in the very early, very early universe um, through the, the radiation uh, emitted at the last scattering of the cosmic microwave uh, background photons. In, in those days, we just had this um, statistical evidence of some intrinsic fluctuations um, away from the galactic plane. We knew the galaxy uh, was causing this uh, red band of emission in the center here, but away from that, uh, there was evidence of, of, of a, a persistent uh, primordial signal um, just at the level of a few micro kelvins in this background three kelvin signal. Um, what's happened in the last 30 years has been a, a, a series of satellites. Um, COBE was followed by WMAP in the early 2000s, uh, which really transformed that uh, the statistical evidence into a detailed picture. Um, of uh, fluctuations in particular, these fluctuations at the characteristic one degree scale, um, uh, which has been used to infer um, the, partly the content of the universe, also the geometry, the spatially flat geometry of the background, um, Fried, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker universe. Um, and most recently, uh, that's been further enhanced through not just the temperature, um, measurements, but also measurements of the polarization of the, of the uh, radiation from the cosmic microwave background from the Planck satellite um, and the, the latest uh, final data being released in 2018 from that satellite um, has really confirmed this, this detailed view 
of uh, first of all the, the the statistics of the density fluctuations at very early times and from that really we build up a picture of the the content of the universe so i'm not going to say that much about uh beyond that about uh, the detailed cosmological observations i thought i should list though just some of the the different probes we now have uh, <clears throat> not just of the cosmic microwave background radiation at the edge of our universe but also uh, the, the distribution of, of galaxies and in particular um, statistical tests of the clustering of galaxies uh, displayed here uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Surveys, uh, uh, the, the culmination of the, the Sloan 4 survey um, that's shown here, the map of not just galaxies but now also uh, systematic uh, measurements of the clustering of, of quasars. Uh, we can understand uh, not just the l distribution of the galaxies, uh, the spatial distribution, but also the velocity field. And that tells us about the gravitational potential in which they move, uh, the abundance of uh, galaxy clusters, um, the gravitational lensing indeed by galaxies. Um, so there's a, a range of probes now. Um, and it's really by making um, detailed statistical tests, you, it, it, the, the best statistical tests really come from these measurements of inhomogeneities in, in the distribution of, of matter and light and indeed the gravitational field around us. And this is the field of, of cosmological perturbations. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about how we probe that and some of the results uh, for studying structure uh, in, in the universe today. Um, the picture, of course, which emerges uh, is that standard model is, is uh, built uh, with an, uh, tells us something about the energy content of the universe. The way structure develops um, is shaped by the dark matter and dark energy in the, in the universe. And the small, and, and indeed it's a small admixture to that is the, the, the baryonic matter of which we're formed. Uh, and even the, the photons of the cosmic microwave background uh, radiation are less than 1% of that density in the universe today. But of course, in the, in the early universe, um, when the universe was smaller and denser, that hot radiation dominates the, the dynamics. So um, cosmological probes are used to build up this uh, picture of the um, material in the universe. Um, and that gives us the, the uh, standard uh, model often talked about in terms of the um, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker uh, space time uh, and where you have a dynamical space time, something Einstein didn't expect when he first proposed his model uh, of general relativity, his model theory of gravity. He just assumed that the universe was static and eternal. But it was Alexander Friedman uh, was the first to realize that there are dynamical solutions and these are now uh, most commonly written in terms of the this uh, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker metric with a single scale factor evolving in time. So it's a very symmetrical space time still because um, at any given cosmic time space is still uniform with uniform density um, uniform curvature and indeed I will assume that the spatial curvature um, at, a, at a given time is, is zero and consistent with those uh, cosmological observations today that simplifies the calculations for us so then we just have to keep track of the uh, scale factor of the universe a of t or sometimes uh, indeed we use the logarithm of that uh, n uh, which is a measure of the logarithmic expansion and um, of course, uh, in the 1920s onwards, uh, people have been able to measure, begin measuring the expansion rate of the universe, and that's the, the Hubble, well, the Hubble constant today, but more generally through time, uh, the Hubble rate, the rate of expansion, A dot over A, which through Einstein's equations is uh, related to the energy density of matter in the universe. So this is the, the um, background cosmology, uh, of which, uh, a, most, uh, most of us learn in, in, uh, from the cosmology textbooks. But really, um, what I'm, gonna, I'm interested in, as I say, the detailed tests 
uh, in perturbation theory come from studying fluctuations uh, in about that model. So let me uh, move on to, to present you the first of my perturbation equations. Here I've, uh, let's look at uh, the simple uh, behavior of waves uh, in that expanding space time. So if you look at density waves in an expanding universe, you get a, a simple um, wave equation of this form where um, you've got the oscillations in density uh, driven uh, by the pressure perturbation. So if I use rho for the density, delta rho um, and the second derivative is, is driven by, um, as I say, pressure gradients, uh, which we can relate to the density through the sound speed. So CS squared times delta rho um, and over a length scale, if we think of a, a wave of wavelength lambda, uh, that has a natural oscillation time, frequency of oscillation. That gives us one time scale in this equation, but we also in an expanding universe have a damping time scale. And so we see there's a sort of characteristic split um, of uh, wavelengths uh, into wavelengths that are um, small enough that the, the pressure gradients win uh, over the damping term. And there we have an underdamped oscillator here in, uh, in yellow. And uh, that corresponds to, to, to small scales in particular, if you, if you look at scales where the uh, gradients win out over the, the Hubble damping, uh, those are uh, wavelengths smaller than the Hubble length. That's the, the inverse of the Hubble time here. On the other hand, um, large scales, um, super Hubble or as often called super horizon scales are actually, um, it's the damping term that wins out. These terms don't oscillate. You've got an overdamped oscillator. So the, the solutions uh, are frozen in, if you like. Um, and, in, and you can see, as I say, if in this uh, schematic graph I've got here, that means that uh, as the Hubble length grows uh, with time in a conventional universe, um, it's the early time large scale solutions, um, wavelengths that are, are frozen in and only at late times um, on smaller scales do they go into this uh, underdamped regime. Um, we should allow for the, the growth of the wavelengths uh, with time as well, but in a conventional uh, uh, matter or indeed radiation dominated universe, uh, the Hubble length grows, grows faster than the, than the uh, expansion of wavelengths uh, with the, of, of co-moving wavelengths. And in fact, we find that all, all modes, um, if we go far enough back in time, all modes would start in this overdamped regime. And this is uh, the, the, the problem of initial conditions, that the standard cosmological mo model dominated by matter and radiation at early times uh, leaves, leaves us with an unanswered question as to where um, the structure um, the perturbations come from that we see. So where, you know, the question is where um, the in initial conditions uh, that the primordial power spectra come from. And you're going to hear much more uh, later in the, the, the conference uh, about different models uh, uh, for the origin of structure. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is really how uh, go through some of the, the tools we use to, to understand and describe indeed uh, the primordial power spectra that we see on large scales um, at the very earliest times uh, in our universe. Um, so I, I should say I'm happy to answer questions. Um, we've got time for discussion at the end. If people have questions uh, during it, please do um, uh, raise a hand or, or type something into the chat um, and uh, I can if, I, if, I, if it's you know, drawn to my attention, I'm more than happy to answer questions uh, as, as I go along. Um, so if there are no questions at this point, I'll move on to thinking about going into the real details, look at some of the uh, tools we use uh, for studying uh, waves in an expanding universe. The key point here then is to, to think about um, uh, I'm going to be interested in fluctuations in the energy and momentum 
uh, in the universe on large scales. And, and in this large scale re regime, we really have to think at the same time as we think about uh, the matter fluctuations, we need to think about the, the metric, the associated perturbations in the geometry. So I'll describe this as, as per metric perturbations uh, in the expanding space. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bit about the um, how we decompose those into uh, to simplify the calculations. Uh, we decompose them into into different uh, modes: uh, scalar, vector, and tensor decomposition uh, on the spatial uh, uh, on the constant time hypersurfaces. So we're looking at these as spatial hypersurfaces. Um, I'll discuss a bit about the the famous uh, gauge problem of those scalar perturbations, and and then. Um, we'll look at some of the uh, dynamical uh, equations. This is uh, Einstein's evolution equations and how actually we can get some, some of the key results uh, for gauge invariant quantities directly, uh, quite simply from, from the Einstein uh, evolution and constraint equations. Um, so were there any questions there that people wanted to ask? Uh, one question is asking about uh, wh whether the wave equation is obtained uh, using uh, squeezed quantum states. Um, indeed, uh, uh, it's, that? Um, so that's got to go back to the initial conditions question here. So if I've got time um, at the, as, as I come to the end of the talk, I'll, I'll really talk about uh, different possible models for the origin of structure. Um, but for now, I'm, I'm going to focus on, the, on, on, on describing the, the nature of the fluctuations and how we characterize those initial conditions. I know that later speakers, in particular Nicola, Nicola Bartolo later today, will, um, will indeed talk about the inflationary origin where these fluctuations, where these initial conditions start uh, as quantum fluctuations uh, in an inflationary era. That's one of the possible models for the origin of structure. Uh, that will be discussed later in, in the conference. If I move on to, to, to just think, you know, if I actually sort of uh, show you some of the um, ways we characterize the, the, the fluctuations in the geometry, first of all, as, as metric fluctuations. Um, so let's uh, work with a, a metric, space time metric G. Um, we've talked so far about the background, um, spatially flat, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker background with a scale factor A and a flat spatial geometry uh, at a given time T. But then we'll introduce a, a, a perturbation now, delta G. Now, uh, the metrics uh, um, got 10 independent components. So we'll split this up into to various pieces. First of all, the time time component or the, the lapse function perturbation A. So this allows for a difference between the coordinate time uh, and, and the proper time uh, for a, an, an observer uh, co-moving with the, these coordinates. Uh, we'll allow for a shift uh, perturbations fluctuation. Uh, so this is a shift vector because it's the G naught I component. And as you can see already, we're beginning to break that up into two parts here. Um, there's a bit that can be derived uh, as the gradient of a scalar. So this is a longitudinal part of the vector and the uh, transverse part uh, S. And then the spatial metric itself um, has a, a trace and trace free or diagonal and off diagonal scalar uh, components. So derived uh, either a conformal rescaling or derived from the gradients of a scalar. Um, we've got a part derived from the gradients of a vector field. And then there's an, an, a bit that can't be derived from either a scalar or a three vector. And so we will call this a, the three tensor um, metric perturbation HIJ. And the reason for do, splitting this up into these scalar vector and tensor parts are that uh, when we work with small perturbations, we will use the linearized uh, perturbation equations. And these uh, three sectors then evolve uh, independently because of their distinct symmetries. Um, uh, and therefore we can simplify uh, the linear calculations by evolving them separately. 
So let's start with what looks like the most complicated of these, uh, which is the, the metric perturbations. And um, these indeed are transverse and trace-free uh, metric perturbations, uh, transverse uh, with respect to a wave. And here, the effect of uh, such a uh, transverse uh, tensor perturbation is demonstrated on this poor individual. Um, these are stretching and squeezing modes um, that we now know, we even see as gravitational waves. Um, so the, this is uh, what happens to you if you have a very large amplitude gravitational wave uh, propagating uh, towards, uh, this is, you think of this as propagating towards the observer. Um, you've got these two transverse directions, E and E bar, and uh, gravitational waves come in two polarizations. The one that's shown here is a so-called plus polarization where you stretch and squeeze vertically and, and horizontally. There's also a cross, an independent uh, cross polarization where you'd be stretching and squeezing along the diagonals. Um, and uh, these are the distinctive um, deformations of uh, a gra passing gravitational wave. And this is part of uh, the, the description of uh, metric perturbations uh, uh, in our in our universe that we need to consider. And if you look at the Einstein equations um, for these, there's actually just a, a single, you can reduce them to a single evolution equation uh, for each of these uh, two, two polarizations. And each wave, uh, wave mode K uh, propagates and obeys a, a wave equation exactly of the form that I, I showed you. Um, the source term would come from the a similar um, symmetric tensorial part of a, an, an isotropic stress. But in fact, uh, for linear matter perturbations, uh, conventional matter perturbations, this uh, anisotropic stress is zero. So you just have a, a free wave equation and the gravitational waves are really the solution of this uh, homogeneous equation for the um, tensor distortions. Uh, and that, so there's no um, constraint equation uh, for these um, tensor uh, components. So they're free uh, to propagate. Uh, they're really the free modes of, of the metric. Um, and as I showed in a wave equation, um, they propagate really um, from the very early universe and potentially give us um, a, a direct glimpse onto uh, the earliest epochs in, in the universe. In the, in the conventional hot Big Bang model, um, the universe is opaque uh, right from the, the Planck time um, to, to the present day. Um, so these uh, gravitational waves are, uh, primordial gravitational waves would be um, a, a way to probe directly the very early universe, even to see through uh, the last scattering of the cosmic microwave background. Um, as yet, uh, we haven't seen primordial gravitational waves, but of course in the last five years, uh, gravitational wave astronomy has really become established as a means of observing distant uh, dark objects colliding black holes in the distant universe. And perhaps the next frontier for, for gravitational waves is to really um, uh, look for the the possible backgrounds of uh, primordial gravitational waves as, as a signature of uh, the origin of structure in the very early universe. So gravitational waves, despite their complex uh, geometry, have a particularly simple uh, evolution equations. Um, the next component part of the uh, metric was to think of those uh, vector perturbations. Um, they're indeed linked to um, perturbations of, of the velocity of matter and the momentum. Um, and this, uh, another way of seeing this uh, scalar vector um, tensor decomposition I've given you here is to think of doing the Fourier transform of the vector field or any uh, velocity field, for example, V here. Um, you can decompose it into wavelengths uh, with a sinusoidal modulation e to the i kx. But, um, a vector then has three components, and you can think and you can think of those as being split um, as a, a longitudinal part, that is, a part um, along the the direction of propagation, and then uh, you have the two again these two transverse uh, 
polarizations for a vector e or uh, e tilde here and so we can we've got an amplitude for each of those um, transverse polarizations uh, as well as the as, as, as well as the longitudinal um, part of the ve vector field and in cosmological perturbation theory we think of this um, longitudinal part is described as a scalar because although you're constructing a three vector it's described directly from the this is simply the uh, the, the spatial gradient of a scalar. So that's uh, longitudinal part is thought of as is indeed um, connected to the um, scalar perturbations, to the density and pressure perturbations, uh, whereas the two transverse parts evolve independently um, and indeed would only be coupled to the anisotropic stress um, in their evolution. So for these, um, but if these, the metric perturbations we had were uh, back in the, the metric perturbations I introduced were F and S. And now um, we have uh, one wave equation and one constraint equation uh, for these uh, vector perturbations. The, the constraint equation comes from the momentum constraint, the G naught I component of the Einstein tensor is related to relate these uh, gives a constraint on the spatial, the spatial metric perturbations uh, are related to the um, momentum, uh, the transverse uh, momentum of the velocity field. And uh, you can obtain from the evolution, the Einstein evolution equations and uh, uh, an evolution equation for the, the metric perturbations, but which as I said, were sourced by the anisotropic stress um, but um, in the absence of anisotropic stress, for example, if you have a perfect fluid, um, in fact, these uh, vector uh, perturbations decay. And indeed, in some cases, uh, such as uh, models where structure originates from scalar field dynamics, for instance, inflationary models, um, and in the scalar fields have, have no um, transverse uh, velocity they are scalars uh, intrinsically scalars so the velocity field is is purely longitudinal and in that case uh, actually the, con the constraint equation requires the vector perturbations to be zero so in many of the most uh, uh, common uh, models for the origin of structure uh, vector perturbations are either absent or or they rapidly decay in the expanding universe and um, so Often, so um, you'll often see these uh, the predictions uh, for the observable vector perturbations to be zero. Nonetheless, um, we have uh, vector um, quantities such as the primordial magnetic fields, um, and uh, even short-lived vector perturbations could have uh, an impact um, on. Um, could potentially have an impact on other uh, components such as uh, gravitation, the gravitational waves or indeed the density uh, perturbations from the early universe. So uh, they're still of interest, um, but they're often um, omitted uh, or set to zero in the first order calculations uh, of, for the origin of structure. Which then brings us to the final and the most uh, um, complicated and but interesting and uh, most uh, uh, closely observed um, component of the metric perturbations uh, which are the scalar uh, components so the longitudinal parts of those uh, of the three vectors and the three tensors um, so there are four uh, scalar four, four um, ways to introduce scalar perturbations of the metric to the lapse function to the shift uh, and as I say, the trace and trace free or the trace and off di the diagonal and off diagonal components of the spatial metric perturbation. And these are the, the metric perturbations that are directly coupled in the, in the linear uh, perturbation theory to the uh, energy and momentum uh, through the energy and momentum constraints. And that's part of what makes the, the, the evolution more involved uh, for these perturbations. Um, and um, famously, they're also um, gauge dependent. Uh, the, they're dependent on the, the choice of coordinates in the inhomogeneous perturbed universe. Um, 
that's because uh, there's a freedom, as we'll see, if we make a, a small, say a first order change in the, in the time coordinate, the choice of time coordinates, think of that as changing the time slicing um, of the four dimensional space time, or indeed we make a change in the spatial threading, which for a scalar would have to be a, the gradient of a, a, a scalar potential delta x, then that will change um, quantities, uh, the perturbation quantities, such as the, the density perturbation, the pressure perturbation, the velocity uh, per, uh, indeed, that are as indicated here. And in particular, they, they also change the, the, the metric perturbations that we've seen, the lapse uh, function A, the, the curvature C, um, they both depend on the, on the temporal uh, gauge, the, the choice of time coordinate. Um, e and B depend on the spatial uh, gauge as well, but um, a useful combination here is in fact the, the potential for the, for the shear um, of the coordinate um, hypersurfaces, which is E prime to minus B but even the shear is still dependent, this linear combination is still dependent on the choice of time uh, slicing. So um, this is uh, an, um, often thought of as a complication um, of the, in the study of uh, scalar metric perturbations, uh, but it's really an intrinsic feature of general relativity that um, you have a freedom to, to change coordinates um, and so it's, you should really think of this uh, as a feature, not a bug. Um, it's really intrinsic to the way uh, perturbation theory works and uh, general relativity works. And so we can use this and we should uh, try to use this to our advantage uh, as I'll show. Um, now it may look a bit mysterious to think of what you think of physical quantities such as density and pressure changing apparently when you change coordinates it's important to realize that really the, the total density uh, at, a, at, a at a given point um, is, is an invariant, it's a scalar quantity, um, and it doesn't change under the change of coordinates. So in the original or in the transformed frame, um, transformed tilde coordinates here, uh, the density at point P is the same. Um, what's happening is you're changing, by changing the the, the space and in particular the time coordinates, um, you're changing the how you identify um, what part of the density you identify as being the background in the background and what is the perturbation. So in the untilted um, coordinates we've got, um, the total density comes from a, the background um, row at T naught at, at a given value of T plus a perturbation Whereas uh, in the perturbed coordinates, uh, tilde, uh, we, we're evaluating the background at a slightly perturbed value tau tilde with respect to the original tau. And so delta rho here in that uh, tau tilde coordinate um, just it, it involves, it, it, it's the perturbation that differs. So if you rearrange this equation, you can see that the difference between the perturbations is basically the difference is equal. Uh, and, and opposite to the difference in the in the background values and so that's why you pick up and if you expand this to first order in delta tau um, you see that you pick up uh, a gauge dependence of delta rho which is proportional to the time derivative of, of rho times the the shift in the in the time coordinate so as i say it's just a, a, a function of the change in coordinates uh, it's not that a, a quantity like density at a, at a physical point is different it's really the, the ambiguity is arising because of the ambiguity in the choice of, of coordinates, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll go on to, to, to sketch here. Uh, if I just pause and see if there's any questions um, that I can answer at this point. Um, Right, I like the, so the last question was asking about explaining the time dependent uh, perturbation geometrically. I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at doing that in just a, just a moment here. Um, I was talking about dark matter and uh, dark energy in the universe and uh, the questions come in as to whether these are present uh, before inflation or after. 
Well, um, again, there's the question uh, of of the or, uh, this uh, idea of inflation in the very early universe, which uh, I will leave mainly to Nicola Bartolo later to talk about. But really, we think of dark matter and dark energy in the standard picture. We think of these as uh, being generated after inflation. So indeed, in the the, the standard interpretation of uh, uh, inflationary models um, is that all the radiation matter uh, and indeed dark energy that we see today uh, would be uh, produced from uh, the fields during inflation or their decay products. So, um, and that's why inflation gives us a potentially an, a model for the origin of not just uh, the dark matter and dark energy, but also their perturbations. Um, okay, um, so the question, uh, the, but there was a question there about um, li explaining this um, uh, the gauge dependence, I think, the question was of the perturbations geometrically. So that's what I'm going to try and show you here. So um, this uh, gauge dependence, as I say, comes from the uh, arbitrariness in the, the choice of the uh, coordinates and this arises uh, when we when we have inhomogeneous perturbations in a way that we don't see in in the in the background because the background is such a symmetrical case um, where uh, the um, it, it, the we have um, spatial homogeneity at every uh, cosmic time so really uh, it, it's 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 very clear which time coordinate to pick, um, certainly uh, in the in a expanding Friedman Robertson Walker universe. Uh, it's it's uh, natural, it's obvious uh, to pick a time coordinate that coincides with a uh, uniform density, which will coincide with uniform pressure, that will coincide with uniform curvature. There's you know, a, this gives you a unique um, a foliation of uh, a, hypersurfaces of constant time and that's what I'm trying to draw here we can think of that as being discerned perhaps by the by the matter and the matter for velocity u uh, but it would be the same choice of hypersurface if we were guided by the geometry say by picking uh, uniform spatial curvature or zero shear all these uh, and that's indicated by these red um, my red coordinate systems here with some uh, um, vector field n orthogonal uh, to the to, to the uh, spatial hypersurfaces uh, determined by the geometry these both coincide in in the in the highly symmetrical background universe when we look at perturbations we we are studying fluctuations about this so there are only small fluctuations so we're only going to consider first order fluctuations but that nonetheless um, the the choice of hypersurface for example if my orange yellow hypersurfaces here are determined by the matter, uh, then perhaps a uniform density hypersurface or a hypersurface orthogonal to the co moving world lines now has some spatial curvature. It may have some, some shear um, as you evolve forward in time uh, along the, 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 the matter uh, for velocity. And so um, it no longer coincides perhaps with a hypersurface uh, drawn in red here that might be determined perhaps by choosing uh, zero shear for, for the, for the um, coordinates as they evolve forward. Or you might choose a, a uniform curvature hypersurface and that would give you a, another coordinate system. So this is the first order change in the coordinate system. And, and in, this, in this case, um, if you think about the the, the background density um, is, um, the, as I say, the split between the, uh, the total density and the background density now changes as you, as you change these, uh, uh, between these different gauges. Um, as I say, the gauge problem is, is, is the, there's, no, there's no unique choice for this. And really, um, relativity tells you that one, one choice is, a, is as good as any other. But as I've said, you, you apparently see different uh, perturbations in these different gauges. So you can use that, as I say, sh you should use that to, to pick um, a, 
the gauge which makes your calculation simplest. Often people uh, would, might wish to work with uh, gauges which remain co-moving with the, the matter even in the presence of, of perturbations. So these are the so-called uh, co-moving gauge and which is like the Lagrangian coordinates in Newtonian fluid system. Um, and the, one of the advantages of that, for instance, is that um, if the, you're studying pressureless matter, such as cold dark matter in the late universe, um, if you're co-moving uh, with, with pressureless matter, then um, the constraint equations actually uh, force the, the lapse function to be zero. And so um, you actually have what's called a synchronous uh, gauge in this case, where the, um, the, the, the um, proper time is, is not perturbed uh, with, with respect to the coordinate time uh, in, this, in this particular gauge. But this um, uh, gauge, uh, actually the, the perturbations uh, in the metric perturbations can become large at late times. So um, a more popular gauge for studying metric perturbations is often one based on the, the geometry, uh, on simplifying the geometry um, of, of the perturbed hypersurfaces. And in particular, the longitudinal gauge uh, eliminates uh, the off-diagonal terms in the, the spatial metric and the shift perturbation. And that coincide, co corresponds to picking hypersurfaces orthogonal to a, a zero shear um, uh, world lines, uh, shown in blue here. Um, and that gives you, for example, a, a simple diagonal uh, perturbations of, of the metric. Remember, you've got, uh, we had four scalar perturbations of the metric, but if we fix, if we can choose the time slicing, uh, the tau coordinate and the um, spatial coordinates x, that's, that's two, uh, two choices which allow us to eliminate two of the, the um, perturbation variables. And in this case, that's two metric perturbation variables and leave us with just these two diagonal uh, perturbations psi and phi. So as we'll see, that's another um, useful choice uh, that people wish, often wish to make. Um, to, to, and as I say, you can do that in order to simplify thing, the calculations. And having done that, you've now fixed, by fixing, uh, removing the gauge ambiguity, any of your remaining variables, uh, such as psi and phi here, the, the metric potentials are, are, gauge in, are now gauge invariant metric potentials. Um, and there's other choices. For instance, you can even mix up the, pick different combinations of uh, spatial um, threading and time slicing. So for instance, the total matter coordinates, uh, you pick the hypersurfaces that, coincide, that are orthogonal to the co-moving world lines but the uh, spatial coordinates that uh, coincide with the longitudinal gauge. Um, so you have uh, some combination of the advantages potentially of those two gauges. Okay, so as I say, but ultimately the choice is yours and you can choose the gauge which simplifies your calculation as long as you're clear and unambiguous in, in how, you, how you make that, that choice. So, um, I was just going to spend uh, <clears throat> the last uh, 15 minutes, I guess, uh, looking at some of the results that we can get from uh, cosmological perturbation theory uh, in this case. Um, let me just see if there's any questions I can... Um, a question about whether the perturbations can trigger chaos uh, in space-time. Well, um, I should emphasize what I'm talking about here are just linear perturbation equations. So um, you, you won't see any chaotic behavior from these linear equations. Uh, there you really need to go beyond into the nonlinear regime. And as far as we know, the large scale structure of our universe that we see is, is well described by linear theory. So um, there's the chaos, uh, there's no, the, what, we're, what we're studying here, these equations won't give rise to chaos. Um, that would have to come from 
perhaps the nonlinear developments, and and maybe indeed you see that on on smaller scales uh, in the universe. Um, the let me see if I can skim any of these questions that I can can answer quickly as I without delaying for too long. Um, this question about the three dimensional metric. Um, so we are perturbing. It's important to realize these are perturbations in effect on top of the, the background metric. So the perturbations really take us beyond uh, the, uh, the, 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 the description that we see um, in, the, in the background metric. Okay, so let's, um, let's uh, if, if we'll have more time for, for questions, I'm very happy to, to take you know, we'll have a chance for discussion uh, later, so I'll, I'll try and answer more questions then. Let's, let's, uh, what I've thrown up, uh, put in front of you here are the Einstein equations uh, for, for the scalar metric uh, uh, perturbations and indeed the energy and momentum conservations equations. So if you look on the, the left hand side, uh, this is basically the perturbed Einstein tensor for the spatial metric perturbations A, that was the lapse function, and C, the curvature perturbation, spatial curvature perturbation. Sigma is, uh, remember, uh, the combination of the other two variables E and B that the, describes the, the shear perturbation. And so we've got uh, two constraint equations. From the naught-naught equation, we get the, Einstein, the energy constraint, and the naught-I equation gives us this, the second line here, this momentum uh, constraint. And then we've got uh, from the ij equations, gij uh, components of the Einstein tensor, the trace and uh, trace-free uh, parts of the evolution equations. They give us uh, second-order evolution equations for C and sigma. Well, remember that's a second-order evolution equation for, for the metric perturbation E, because sigma is already E primed minus B. Um, and they have to be consistent uh, in Einstein's theory with the evolution of the energy and, and, and the momentum, again, in, which uh, have, um, but of course they are in, in themselves coupled uh, to the metric perturbations here. Okay, so it may look quite intimidating, but remember we've, we're allowed to, to, limp, to pick our gauge uh, to simplify these calculations as we wish. We've got two, uh, We've, we've, um, there's no dependence in these equations on the, the spatial gauge now because we've eliminated E and B in favor of sigma, but we've still got the choice to choose the temporal gauge. So let's look at, for instance, at one of these uh, equations, the evolution equation for the shear. And um, th there's a, the gauge in which you, this uh, simplifies uh, most clearly is, is a gauge in which you simply set the shear to be zero. And then what was an evolution equation, uh, if, you, if you pick your coordinates such that the shear is zero, this becomes a constraint equation uh, between the two remaining variables, um, um, metric variables uh, C and A. And indeed in the zero shear or longitudinal gauge, uh, these are precisely the, the metric potentials phi and psi and uh, we get a constraint equation relating uh, psi to phi and the anisotropic uh, the scalar part of the anisotropic uh, stress. But again, if we've got a perfect fluid or perhaps a minimally coupled scalar field, um, there is no anisotropic stress in such a system. And so in those systems, we get um, a, the simplification that in the zero shear gauge, psi actually equals phi. So we've reduced um, the scalar metric perturbations down to a single uh, metric potential uh, phi or psi, um, they're equal. So then uh, in, in that gauge, we can think about uh, looking perhaps at the uh, energy and momentum constraints, the first two of these equations. In fact, you can see um, that um, there's, a, in fact, they both uh, uh, include this uh, combination C primed uh, plus HA. So if we eliminate uh, that and we work in the zero shear gauge again, so zero shear is just going to eliminate this shear term, but remember phi is equal to uh, 
uh, minus uh, uh, phi is equal to psi, so A is equal to minus C is equal to this uh, metric potential phi. So if we now eliminate uh, C prime plus H, um, we're just left with uh, this spatial divergence, uh, Nabla squared, uh, spatial Lagr Lagrangian acting, uh, spatial Laplacian, I should say so, acting on C, uh, sigma is zero, and C is equal to phi. So what we're left with is, is an equation uh, for the spatial Laplacian acting on the metric potential and equating that with uh, the density uh, and uh, momentum potential here. And uh, this is what's often referred to as the relativistic Poisson equation. It tells us that in the shear, zero shear gauge, this metric potential obeys a Poisson equation and where the, also you have to be careful that the source is not simply the density perturbation in the longitudinal gauge, it's actually a combination of the density perturbation and the momentum in the longitudinal gauge. But in fact, what you've got here is, is in fact the, the density perturbation in that co-moving orthogonal gauge uh, that I described earlier. Um, so this is uh, one of the classic sort of gauge invariant uh, um, equations that you get. Um, relating the Newtonian potential to the co-moving density. And in, because it involves spatial gradients, you can see that uh, if the um, co-moving density remains uh, finite uh, on, on small scales, uh, then uh, as the, on small scales where the spatial gradients are large, uh, the Newtonian potential becomes small. So in any case, so certainly the Newtonian potential becomes small relative to the co-moving density perturbations on small and specifically on sub-Hubble scales. But conversely, on, on super-Hubble scales, it's actually for a finite Newtonian potential, it's the co-moving density that, that is suppressed on, on large scales. Um, so on large scales, you really need to, to include the effect of the, the metric perturbations in the longitudinal gauge. But on small scales, um, they, the the metric perturbations become suppressed relative to the, the, the co-moving density here. Um, so finally, let's watch the time. Um, the final sort of result I'd like to present from the, the relativistic perturbation theory is to is to to look at a different gauge and to look at um, this uh, energy uh, conservation equation. And consider that, uh, in, to simplify this, uh, we can think about how this energy conservation equation would look uh, in a gauge where we um, eliminate uh, the density perturbation. So this is the uniform density gauge. And in this gauge, we, uh, the, the spatial curvature perturbation in the uniform density gauge is referred to as zeta. Um, the pressure perturbation, well, if we had a barotropic fluid, if the pressure was simply a function of the density and we choose a uniform density gauge, the pressure perturbation itself would also have to vanish. But more generally, you can have, a, a, if any remaining pressure perturbation in the uniform density gauge is a non-adiabatic pressure perturbation. So then when we look at what the, this energy uh, conservation equation, the continuity equation gives us, if we've set uh, the density perturbation, we construct a, a gauge in which the density perturbation is zero. This again reduces to a, a constraint equation, and it's a constraint equation for the for the curvature per the, the curvature perturbation c primed, which in this gauge we call zeta primed, and we can relate that to the remaining density perturbation. So that's the non-adiabatic uh, pressure perturbation. Uh, and the divergence of, of the velocity. Um, this is actually the velocity in the longitudinal gauge. Um, that, uh, but ag again, we use the result that in the large scale limit where we can neglect spatial gradients, we then see that there's curvature perturbation in the uniform density gauge. Well, it will be constant, zeta primed will be zero for adiabatic perturbations. And zeta primed will only change on large scales due to the non-adiabatic pressure perturbations. Uh, and this is a very powerful result um, for tracing back um, the, it's this um, scalar curvature perturbation zeta 
but for adiabatic perturbations, we can relate uh, what we see on large scales today, or in particular when modes re-enter the horizon at late times in the universe, uh, we can relate back to um, the prim primordial uh, value uh, power spectrum because zeta is, is conserved in the super horizon regime for, for adiabatic perturbations. So maybe I just briefly mentioned that, so that when we talk, so this gives us a nice sort of geometrical view of what uh, the difference between adiabatic and, and isocurvature perturbations. So for adiabatic perturbations where the pressure, certainly with the vanishing non-adiabatic pressure, that would mean that the, that's the case where the uniform density and the uniform pressure hypersurfaces coincide in red and in purple here. Whereas isocurvature or any non-adiabatic perturbations uh, would mean that on a uniform pressure hypersurface in red, say here, you, you have a finite pressure perturbation still on the uniform density hypersurfaces. And the classic example of that would say be matter isocurvature perturbations. So in the early universe, where if we think of radiation and non-relativistic matter, for adiabatic perturbations, you have you can construct a curvature perturbation on uh, the uniform radiation radiation density hypersurfaces in red here, or on the uniform matter density hypersurfaces. And for adiabatic perturbations, those two is those two quantities that coincide. Uh, isocurvature matter perturbations uh, correspond to the difference between uh, the curvature of the radiation and the matter uh, hypersurfaces. So adiabatic perturbations are very um, uh, generated where you have a single source for all the fluctuations, or uh, they can be uh, produced even if you had initially non adiabatic perturbations if if you have for example thermal equilibrium between two species or indeed if the matter and, and radiation uh, are both produced from uh, subsequently out of the an initial thermal equilibrium situation so these matter isocurvature perturbations require some kind of non equilibrium uh, process uh, and require some uh, more than one source uh, for, for the for the fluctuations. So, for example, this might come from multi-field models of inflation, but where the where the um, the mul multiple fields are involved in the reheating process, so you get an inhomogeneous reheating process, for example. But what we've learned uh, from the CMB satellites, such as WMAP and Planck, is really there's now very tight constraints on the allowed amplitude of uh, isocurvature perturbations. And the, the perturbations we see are consistent uh, with, with adiabatic perturbations, the picture shown at the top here. Zeta, as I say, is a very um, useful way of thinking about uh, fluctuations uh, produced from models uh, from, from uh, uh, very, this is a very useful way of tracing back the, the perturbations, the density perturbations we see at late times to much earlier times because it uh, remains constant on large scales. Um, you can see, oh, uh, maybe I haven't really spelt this out, but in fact, when you look at the way zeta is constructed um, from the density perturbations, it, it really, well, as I said, it corresponds to the curvature perturbation on uniform density hypersurfaces. And there's a, a simple interpretation of uh, how to calculate this from some initial uh, model for the origin of structures such as inflation where you've got quantum field fluctuations on an, an initially spatially flat hypersurface, then zeta, the curvature perturbation on the uniform density hypersurfaces, you can be thought of really as the inhomogeneous evolution in different patches of the universe um, dependent on those initial conditions and then, then uh, zeta really is the local perturbation in the expansion. So at first order, uh, you then get a, a linear relation between zeta and the field fluctuations. More generally, you can actually extend that to nonlinear order, and this is one way in which you produce, in fact, this second term here is uh, produces a 
specific kind of uh, higher order fluctuation called, which corresponds to a local type non-Gaussianity from field fluctuations, um, as opposed to the intrinsic non-linearity of field fluctuations, which might be more of the equilateral type non-Gaussianity. So this is an example of how higher order fluctuations for instance, that you might seek to measure in the bispectrum uh, can tell you about the origin of fluctuations during inflation. What we have though uh, currently is well described by the, the temperature and polarization anisotropies we see on the, the cosmic microwave background sky are well described by Gaussian and adiabatic uh, fluctuations, but crucially not quite scale invariant uh, in, their, in the distribution. There's slightly more power on the on the large scales than we see in the primordial power spectrum on smaller scales, this so-called red spectrum. And uh, so the, this um, beautiful picture of uh, the cosmic microwave background anisotropies is in fact well fit by a simple six parameter model. Four parameters are describing the background cosmology, but two parameters are describing the initial amplitude and tilt um, scale dependence of, of the primordial power spectrum. And so uh, this is the context in which we, we produce uh, and explore different models uh, for the origin of structure. Some of these you'll hear about um, in, the, in the talks later this week. Um, there's, uh, so you probe these different models through the, through the uh, primordial perturbations they produce and uh, what I've tried to do is give you um, an insight into uh, some of the um, tools that we use, some of the quantities that we talk about when we're talking about the scalar, the vector, the tensor perturbations um, and as I say the interest here is that these perturbations uh, can provide a window uh, onto the very early universe whether it's the tensor metric perturbations or the scalar curvature fluctuations, um, we can trace back uh, the structures we see on the largest scales, uh, largest observable scales in our universe today, back to high energy physics, possibly to, to vacuum fluctuations uh, in models such as inflation or alternative pre Big Bang or type mo or, or bounce uh, models of, of the universe. And the way to distinguish these, we test these now, is really through, through the um, cosmological perturbation theory applied to cosmic microwave background, uh, large, increasingly through large scale structure. Uh, and I'm sure in the next 10 years, it will, will, it will be the, the large galaxy surveys that take this field forward. Um, and um, there's lots of, uh, uh, we're, we're looking for interesting information in the power spectra and the higher order correlators uh, uh, to learn about uh, the possible models uh, for the origin of structure. And uh, I think the goal remains uh, indeed to see not just those scalar metric perturbations, but also the primordial tensor fluctuations, the gravitational waves that could tell us about the very, very early universe. But I think at that point I should stop. I've had my full hour. Um, I hope you've uh, uh, managed to follow uh, what I've been saying. I know we've got time for discussion and questions. So yeah. I'm happy to, to, to answer those, take some of those questions now. Yep, uh, Professor Vance, like you may wish to look at it, the chat. Yes, Many questions yeah. have been asked, so you may wish to address them first. Yeah, let's have a look at this. I didn't want... Um, if I can bring up the chat. Um, okay, so, well, one question here is if observations are gauge dependent, then how can we make uh, the correct predictions? So <laughs> maybe I, I, I needed to emphasize more. Uh, the observations uh, will be, must, must indeed be gauge independent. So it's the calculations, it's the way you do the calculations that are gauge dependent. So basically you can choose coordinates uh, to do your calculations. In effect, you're choosing variables in which to do a calculation. But a quantity such as the, the temperature, uh, the temperature you observe in the CMB sky in a particular direction, that indeed must be gauge independent. Um, but how you break that down uh, into, in particular, 
the gauge dependence is really how you break that down into the background and, and the fluctuations, um, whether you treat it as fluctuations of, of um, the density on a uniform geometrical hypersurfaces or fluctuation in the hypersurfaces with respect to uniform density. Those are, those are um, calculational choices you can make. In, in, but uh, if you get the answer right, you should be able to calculate it uh, in any gauge. So, um, if someone else, by the way, asked me about uh, just, I uh, don't know if this was in the general chat, about uh, what would be trace. Uh, I, I, I referred a couple of times to the trace and, and trace free um, uh, components of the metric. Um, in particular, the, the spatial metric is, is really a, a three by three, you can think of it as a three by three uh, matrix. And uh, so, um, the, the the trace literally is what you get by adding up the terms along the diagonal. So the trace is really uh, the, the diagonal terms and the trace free, it must be telling about the, the off diagonal terms in that metric. And um, so it's also, so, so um, for the spatial metric, therefore the trace uh, distortions, um, Another way to think of that is is that the trace distortions are are really an overall scaling, so that's actually a conformal scaling of them, of what would be a flat uh, spatial metric in the background. Um, but um, uh, and and then the trace free is is the other the the other component, the distortion uh, of the the spatial metric. So so that was the answer to the question of trace and trace free. Um, now there's a, a more detailed question here about stochastic perturbation theory and I know my colleague um, uh, Vincent Venin from Paris is going to uh, talk about the stochastic approach to inflation uh, later in the conference. Um, so indeed uh, the stochastic approach is one where you, you um, instead of making so in my talk I've made this distinction between the background and and uh, the inhomogeneous perturbations but of course as as the wavelength of the inhomogeneous perturbations become longer and longer uh, and if really the spatial gradients become smaller and smaller you might ask well what's the difference between that and the background and indeed in the stochastic approach um, there's a, a it embraces that and says, well, once uh, we'll have a, introduce a coarse graining scale and once uh, perturbations be go beyond the coarse graining scale, we'll treat them as part of the background. And that's a, a way to avoid this perhaps arbitrary distinction between uh, background and perturbations. Um, so the question I was being asked in the chat was, does that choice of uh, coarse graining represent a, a gauge choice? Um, I, so I, I wouldn't say necessarily that coarse graining represents gauge choice, but I think it is, it, it's worth, uh, it's important to realize that, um, you, you, you implicitly will have to, uh, will have to make a choice of gauge when you study, um, variables in this way. Um, and, uh, so in, indeed, if you're considering, for example, fluctuations in in a field uh, moving into the background as, as it becomes coarse grained you should realize that when you calculate for example the amplitude of the field fluctuations uh, that's a gauge in, that's a gauge dependent quantity and in and because you're interested in that quantity in the large scale regime uh, gauge dependence will indeed be important um, now, typically we calculate uh, the field fluctuations during inflation, say in the spatially flat gauge. And so indeed you need to be checked that you're being uh, consistent. Therefore, if you're using the spatially flat field fluctuations, um, you should, um, you're implicitly assuming that your background that you're absorbing them into is indeed a spatially flat background. And so, yes, there is a, there's an implicit, you need indeed to be careful of the gauge choice uh, in these um, 
discussion of uh, the, the, the large scale uh, fluctuations and therefore that is very relevant to the stochastic um, uh, description uh, of uh, long wavelength fluctuations. Um, gosh, I see there are lots of questions here, which is great. <laughs> Shall I just keep, I'll keep going. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Um, um, so, um, I also have a question in non-adiabatic perturbation theory. Uh, there's a 180 degree phase change between time and space coordinate so as i drew it i think this is in, in my picture uh where in adiabatic they're parallel um well let me i think this is really let's maybe take this picture here um uh, so let's um uh, yeah, I, th I think it's um, and perhaps don't take too seriously my, the uh, details of the drawing here. Um, certainly, the uh, the uniform matter and radiation hypersurfaces uh, in my for the case of adiabatic uh, perturbations, really the uh, they coincide. So, sorry if they're separated here by a small amount. It's only so you could see that there really are the two lines here. But um, the idea in my diagram is really that um, for adiabatic perturbations, if you pick a, a hypersurface where the radiation is uniform, uh, then uh, the matter um, fluctuations, the matter density will also be uniform. Uh, and that's, as I say, that's kind of uh, naturally emerges from, for example, single field models of inflation or indeed bounce models with just a single degree of freedom. So if you imagine, if you imagine the fluctuations originate from quantum fluctuations in a single surface, uh, then uh, that, those initial quantum fluctuations um, introduce uh, the same perturbation for uh, the matter, the radiation, and indeed all the decay products uh, of that uh, high energy field. Um, so I think that's really uh, all the pro perhaps all you should take away from this diagram. The, the non-adiabatic case below where you've got uh, is really the statement that they really, um, uh, non-adiabatic is, is any difference between these two. And, and the way that's conventionally uh, represented is through um, the dimensionless uh, matter isocurvature perturbation which is, well, there's a conventional factor of three, but it's basically, um, it, 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 it's this difference between zeta gamma and zeta matter. Uh, so in fact, traditionally it is the, if I get this right, I think uh, the, the, it's the dimensionless density perturbation of matter on the uniform uh, radiation hypersurface. So, um, so the traditional uh, matter isocurvature perturbations uh, are non-adiabatic precisely because w once you're on the uniform radiation hypersurfaces, there is still a, a, a matter density perturbation on those hypersurfaces. Uh, and and that, that's uh, indicative of a non-adiabatic um, uh, matter perturbation. Um, can vector perturbations oscillate in any domain? <laughs> um, now, I don't know if that's the case. So I guess if you go back to my, uh, the linear equation I had here, oops, which I can't seem to, oh, hang on, let me see if I can move back on my slides. Here we go. Um, go back a long way back in the slides, I find the uh, evolution equations for vectors. Yeah, so in the Einstein equations, the linearized Einstein equations, I don't think you do see any, um, you don't see any oscillation here um, in, in the, because there's no spatial gradient term here. Uh, and I, in the um, evolution equation, the way, what might otherwise be the wave equation, 
uh, and the evolution equation for the for the vector uh, part of the, the the metric perturbations. And I think that's correct because they're not longitudinal. So pressure waves are driven by the, the pressure gradients. Um, so the density, the scalar density is coupled to the scalar velocity and you get, um, uh, and, and the scalar velocity is driven by the pressure gradients. And um, it's a different kind of evo evolution equation you get here for the, um, for the transverse part of the velocity perturbation. Um, of course, once you get into the nonlinear uh, evolution or of course so basically if there is any oscillation it would have to come from the anisotropic stress here uh, being sourced in some way by the by the um, velocity term here I mean that doesn't happen in a perfect fluid but in an imperfect fluid um, it, yes I don't know if there's a case in which you can get oscillations here, but I think there's a reason why you don't automatically get oscillations like you do for a, a longitudinal um, uh, perturbation. <coughs> Jerome, good morning, Jerome. I uh, was asking if there are, Jerome Martin, obstructions to build gauge invariant formalism at second order in the perturbations. So <laughs> um, I've just talked about first order perturbations. Um, uh, life gets more interesting still if you go to second order um, that's where non-gaussianities typically come from um, uh, and so uh, and, and people in the past it had been said that you couldn't build uh, gauge invariant perturbations at second order um, but in fact I think that uh, but but we've learned in uh, that you can um, uh, but there are even more ambigu additional ambiguities come in at, at second order because you've got all the ch choices you made at first order um, can f feed in and almost multiply in terms of ambiguities at second order. Nonetheless, if you, if you make a, a well-defined uh, choice of, of coordinate system, basically uh, there, are, there are physical quantities such as say the the pressure perturbation on uh, non -ad on on uniform density hypersurfaces. So if you like the non adiabatic pressure perturbation um, at second order, yes, you can you can construct that. Um, you have to be, and that's an example where not only do you have to define the choice of temporal hypersurface, the time slicing, but to get the pressure perturbation at second order, you, you also need to now specify the spatial threading at first order. Um, but yes, it can be done. And there are examples uh, 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 there in the, in, in the literature, but it wasn't done until relatively recently, the last 10 years or so, that that's become a standard. Um, there's a question about the parity property of gravity and modify gravity theories, which I haven't gone into. And I, mm, is there any signature of parity violation for gravity in the primordial gravitational waves? Um, so um, certainly um, it's something you could look for. Well, remember we haven't seen any primordial gravitational waves yet. Um, I haven't really talked about that, but uh, people are certainly looking, for example, in the polarization of the CMB, there's distinctive patterns of polarization, so-called B-mode polarization in the CMB sky. Um, and if you did have a parity violating theory of gravity, I imagine, but I'm not an expert in this, that you, you would expect, uh, for, you know, you've got those two polarization modes, for example. <clears throat> and it is possible, uh, yeah, and there are certainly models which produce um, a chiral um, uh, p a distribution of gravitational waves where you enhance one uh, polarization uh, over another. Um, and so um, that's certainly something which is um, studied and considered when people are looking in, uh, for, for gravitational waves. As yet, there's just constraints on that, but it's yes, it was certainly something. So, 
parity violation, I think, is, is something you could test um, in, in, through um, the, the, the two polarizations of, of primordial gravitational waves. Um, but that's something for, for the future. Um, David, there is a question yeah. by Robert Brandenberger. This is oh, Sri Ram yeah. here. Yeah, um, oh, yeah, I see further down. I'm just going to, for want of time, I, I'm just yeah. going to identify some questions if you don't mind. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Okay. Uh, David, there's a question by Robert Brandenberger concerning Jerome's question. According to the Stuart Walker lemma, there is no interesting quantities which are gauge invariant to arbitrary order. Interesting means not constant in space time. Yeah. Yes. I think, I think, I think there's, I, so I, what I was saying is that, uh, like, conversely, I think there are <laughs> gauge invariant quantities um, that you can construct. And I know you can construct them at second order. And I don't, I'm not aware of any obstacle constructing them to really to arbitrary order um, of quantities. You know, I was giving the example of pressure perturbations, uh, even, you know, without requiring them to be constant in space time. So there is this Stuart Walker lemma that says um, uh, gauge, the gauge invariant quantities, uh, to, to be gauge invariant, they really have to be uh, constant uh, in the background space time. Um, I, I, and, I, and I think maybe it's the... Uh, the notion that there are not really, so I, th I think gauge invariance is used in, I would distinguish two meanings of, you know, uses of the term gauge invariant. One is gauge independent. Um, and uh, so, um, for example, gravitational waves at first order are <laughs> gauge independent. You really, they really don't have any gauge dependence. Um, and that's what the Stuart Walker lemma kind of states that there's no interesting quantities uh, that are, I, I think it, they're really referring to gauge uh, quantities that are not gauge dependent. What I'm talking about is gauge invariant quantities such as uh, gauge invariant pressure or density perturbations, which are, which are intrinsically, so density perturbation is intrinsically gauge dependent. But what you can do is you can construct gauge invariant combinations um, that are that are well defined that, that are fixed, basically gauge fixed quantities, and are then unambiguous to arbitrary order. And you know that, and that is what we do most. David, of the I think. Time. The, yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I think Robert had minute. another comment. Uh, Robert had another comment. Arun, uh, can I request uh, that Professor Robert Brandenburg be allowed to speak? Unmute, I'm, I, I can't control. Yeah, yeah, okay, sir, just a minute. Meanwhile, we can just attend to one or two questions, uh, David, as uh, connecting Robert. Um, uh, you know, there's a question uh, from uh, Scient and Chaudhry about during reheating or stochastic particle production, how to treat out of equilibrium effects. Yeah, I'm difficult to hear you. Uh, sir, your voice is breaking. Yeah. Is breaking, yeah. Uh, well, I'll repeat the question. It was, it was just, uh, well, I mean, if Robert can join, I'm happy to... <laughs> to, to Oh, uh, Robert's saying he doesn't. Hey, have Robert a says he doesn't microphone. have a good microphone. Okay. <laughs> but I th okay. let me just let me just say briefly with Robert that I think I, I think I was trying to answer his second comment there that uh, there are physically well defined quantities, but they are not gauge invariant. So that's that's what I I think what I am referring to. Uh, I'm referring to the fact you can you can um, yeah make a well defined statement about a second order pressure perturbation that is unambiguous. Uh, but it's not to say that the pressure perturbation is independent of gauge. It's simply you can fix it and remove the gauge ambiguity uh, at second order. Yeah. Um, the out of equilibrium question. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to. Uh, so if I, oh, I had seen that somewhere, where was that? Um, during uh, during reheating, how to treat out of equilibrium explicitly in the quantum fluctuations? 
Um, I'm not quite sure about the what, what what's being th thought about there. I mean, I've of course implicitly been talking about linear perturbations, so these are really perturbing about um, well here about a, a well-defined vacuum state. Um, out of equilibrium effects, uh, well, it depends. I think it depends what, what effects you're, you're looking to study here. Sometimes there are nonlinear um, fluctuations that you can simply, you can continue to study in a, not, in a perturbative expansion. Um, sometimes there are um, uh, instant on effects, something which is non-perturbative. And uh, I think that's, I think that would just be, um, it, depends on the case by case, uh, whether you can indeed treat this, you can find a, a, an effective way of treating that. Um, yeah, so I'm not, not sure if that is answering the question. <laughs> I think it's ducking the question. <laughs> Um, maybe maybe just this last yeah. question, uh, David, about observation of periodicity of small scale fluctuations. Um, Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Do you want to say that again? Sorry, you're breaking up. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'm sorry. Uh, observational probes of adiabaticity on small of small scale fluctuations. Oh. Um, it, yeah. So ob probes of adiabaticity. Right. I should s emphasize that adiabaticity is really a large. I mean, it, it's it's really only a useful thing to think about in, in the large scale. I should say. Um, so this uh, property of, and therefore it's very useful for, it's very important for initial conditions uh, for primordial spectra on large scales. But as modes come inside the horizon, um, they, you, you get a mixing of isocurvature and adiabatic um, uh, fluctuations. So, um, I, uh, so I, it's not something which you, so really when we're probing adiabaticity, um, we're usually talking about probing the, the initial conditions for the fluctuations, uh, implicitly talking about the, the, the nature of the fluctuations in the large scale regime. Um, so the question then I see says, uh, if, but if we want to probe that down onto smaller scales, um, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, and of course with the CMB, we have, direct, you know, relative, you know, almost direct observations really of the, the, the oscillations in the primordial plasma and therefore whether we can see whether they, they start as uh, from adiabatic or isocurvature initial conditions. I guess the question here was about scales that are not accessible to CMB observations. Okay, so if, we, if we're um, on smaller scales, perhaps the last 40 E foldings of inflation. Well, um, They'll be important. So isocurvature, per, yeah. So you're then looking to see whether, yeah, it would be in, in principle they could have effects. You know, um, non-adiabatic, uh, any density perturbations could have effects on small scales, whether they're adiabatic or non-adiabatic. Um, uh, for instance, through um, uh, well spectral distortions in the CMB or or even uh, perhaps secondary induced gravitational waves if you've got large density fluctuations. Um, so I, in principle, yes, you are sensitive to those density fluctuations. Whether there's any distinctive signature of them being uh, non-adiabatic or uh, adiabatic or non-adiabatic, um, typically you've only got sort of indirect information, perhaps the spectrum of gravitational waves uh, produced or the the amplitude of the spectral distortions. So I think there's probably a degeneracy between whether the modes are adiabatic or, or isocurvature uh, on those small scale uh, regimes. Um, yeah, so I, so I think you are potentially sensitive to them, but I'm not sure that you could distinguish uh, whether they are adiabatic uh, once you get onto smaller scales than the CMB. Um, We're running out of time now. You want to continue for a few more minutes? No, we have a talk scheduled exactly at 11.30. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I don't sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Eat into the time yeah. for yeah. others. So, um, I think there is a raised yeah. hand here, but I think we will pass it. So we'll stop yeah. now. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for all the questions. <laughs> I hope I made a reasonable stab at answering at least some of them. So thank you very much.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David.